We're ready for your testimony, so we're going to have you sworn, and uh, I see uh, you have uh, counsel here. So let's, uh, should we first swear the witness and, uh, okay. Mr. McKenzie, will you swear on a religious document or do you wish to affirm? Uh, I will affirm. For the record, please state your full name and spell it out. Jeremy Mitchell McKenzie, J-E-R-E-M-Y-M-I-T-C-H-E-L-L. M-A-C-K-E-N-Z-I-E. Do you solemnly affirm that the evidence to be given by you to this commission shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. Okay. Afternoon, Mr. Commissioner. My name is... Turn on. Afternoon, Mr. Commissioner. My name is Sharif Boda. I'm counsel to Jeremy McKenzie. Uh, Mr. McKenzie was summoned to testify here um, this afternoon, uh, his testimony is compelled. I would just like to make clear that he is invoking his protections under the uh, Canada and Ontario Evidence Act um, uh, to protect his interests against self-incrimination. And of course, he benefits from the protection of Section 13 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Okay, and I, I will deem uh, that the witness uh, <clears throat> has objected to answer each and every question. Uh, on the ground uh, that his answers uh, may intend to incriminate him or tend to establish his liability to a civil proceeding at the instance of the Crown or any person uh, but for the acts you've invoked. Okay, is that, that adequate? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Okay, so Mr. McKenzie, we're uh, ready to go. Uh, Commission Council, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Good afternoon, Mr. McKenzie. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, my name is John Mather. I'm one of the Commission Council. Um, you are appearing today via video conference from the Saskatoon Correctional Centre, is that correct? That's correct. And uh, we understand that you are being held uh, in relation to charges in a matter that is unrelated to the protests in Ottawa and Coots, is that correct? That's correct. Um, the Commission understands that you, uh, you are from Nova Scotia, is that correct? Yes, sir. And where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, Pictou County, Nova Scotia. Um, and we understand that you were a member of the Canadian Armed Forces? That's correct. From 2017, or sorry, 2003 until 2017. And what rank did you achieve in the Armed Forces? Uh, I retired as a Master Corporal. Um, and you have produced a letter through your counsel uh, to the Commission, and it's a letter that you sent to the Senate. Um, do you know what I'm referring to? I believe so, yes. So if we could pull up JMK703. Mr. McKenzie, can you first just let me know if you can see the document on the screen and you're able to read what it says? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you. Um, and is uh, this is a letter that's uh, entitled Diagalon's List of Demands to the Canadian Senate. Do you see that? Yes. Okay, and I'll... Uh, I'll ask you some questions about Diagalon in a moment. Um, and can you just confirm for us if we can scroll down to the bottom? Just again, for, for the, the commission's benefit, but also potentially yours, we see that uh, it has a signature block for you at the bottom. Um, do you, and, uh, and there's no signature here. Do you know if you ever signed this letter? Uh, no, I sent it digitally to uh, to the Senate members. Okay. Do you do you recall when you sent it sent it to the Senate? It was several days before the uh, Emergency Act was uh, revoked by the government. Sorry, and perhaps three. And sorry, and with the audio, I just didn't catch that. Did you say before it was invoked or revoked? Before it was revoked by okay. the government, perhaps three days, three four days. Thank you. Um, we can take uh, the letter down, but Mr. McKenzie, I'm going to ask you some questions, and if you need to look at the letter, just let me know, okay? Um, yes, in, sure. in, in the letter to the Senate, you describe yourself as a podcaster and a comedian. I take it that's accurate? Yes, it is. And it's the Commission's understanding that you podcast under the name Raging Dissident. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, at one time, you had a YouTube channel. Is that correct? Yes. And do you know uh, uh, at any point? Uh, do you know how many followers that YouTube channel had? 
I have had several that have um, uh, been removed by YouTube for various reasons. Um, several times it's been 10,000, 12,000. I think the highest may have been 12 or 13,000. Okay. And you also have a Telegram channel? Yes, sir. Okay. And how many followers have you had? I appreciate you were giving some ranges there on your, on your Telegram channel. Uh, roughly, I would say upwards around 14,000. Okay. Um, and on the YouTube and Telegram channel, are you posting under the name Raging Dissident? Yes. Okay. And uh, I, I understand that you also have an Instagram, Instagram account using the name Raging Dissident. Is that correct? Yes, I do. Um, and uh, are there any other social media that you use? Those are the primary one. Uh, Rumble as well is another video sharing website. Um, primarily, those are the uh, the ones I, I use most heavily. Um, I also have a personal page that I typically just use for advertising links and so on on Facebook, um, Gab, and um, yeah, I believe that's it. And what's the URL for that uh, personal website? My my own personal uh, dot com website. Yeah, the one you were, the one you were just referencing. Oh, I have a, a Facebook uh, just a, a Facebook page. Uh, there's a Rumble website and uh, URL, but my personal website is uh, ragingdistant dot com. Okay. Thank you. Um, and do you use the messaging service Slack to communicate? No. Okay. Have you ever used Slack? No, I've never heard of it. Okay. Um, in the letter to the Senate, you identify yourself as a founding member of the People's Party of Canada. Is that correct? Yes. The, uh, when the party was uh, stood up, it required a certain amount of signatures to uh, register federally. I believe maybe 250, 500, something in that range. Uh, Mr. Bernier put out a request for people that wanted to support his platform to see the party created to uh, fill out a, a form and sign it and mail it into the appropriate address, uh, which I did. Right. And you... And, and you describe yourself as an enthusiastic supporter of the party, then? Um, I, would, I wouldn't go as far as enthusiastic, but I, I am a supporter, yes. Okay, so if we could pull up the letter uh, to the Senate again. JMK3. And if we could scroll, zoom in, please. And just give me a moment. You can continue scrolling down. Continue scrolling down, please. Stop there. It says here in your letter, Mr. McKenzie, I am also a founding member of the People Party of Canada and enthusiastically supported the party through my social media. So would you at least agree with me that you enthusiastically support the People's Party of Canada through your social media? Oh, is the, it appears we're having some technical difficulties, so if everyone could bear with us for a moment. <clears throat> so we, uh, the technical team has said that it will be five minutes to resolve the issue, Mr. Commissioner. Okay, we'll uh, take a five minute break and then uh, come back. Can you hear me right now? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. And I can hear you and apologies for the technical difficulty and I appreciate your patience while we sort it out. Uh, before we got cut off and I'm not sure when you last heard me, I had asked you whether or not you were an enthusiastic supporter of the People's Party of Canada and you suggested it wasn't necessarily enthusiastic. I had then pulled up the letter that you'd sent to the Senate um, in which you say, and hopefully you can see it, uh, that you're a founding member and you enthusiastically supported the party through my social media, public speaking and attending events held by Maxime Bernier, as well as personal friends Mark Friesen and Randy Hillier. Do you see that? Yes, sir. And so I take it you agree with me that you were an enthusiastic supporter, at least to the extent you wrote that in the letter to the Senate. Correct. Um, I misinterpreted the question. I, I thought you maybe perhaps meant at the current time. I haven't been really involved in any um, party politics since around this time. And um, 
in, in as pertains to the letter enthusiastically, I, I guess I was referring to throughout the previous federal election that had just transpired in the, the fall. Okay. Um, and on your, and, and, and you mentioned earlier that you are a podcaster. Uh, the commission also understands that uh, these podcasts are often videotaped as well and the video is streamed. Is that fair? That's correct. Okay. Um, so it's not just an audio format when you talk about a podcast. No, it's it's both. I usually extrapolate the audio and then upload it after to several streaming platforms for typical uh, more more uh, typical podcasting consumption. Right. Um, and on your podcasts, um, I take it you would you agree that you're an outspoken about your criticism of the federal government? Yes, sir. Okay. And you're also outspoken about your criticism of the RCMP. Yes. And you were, as a general matter, opposed to the COVID-19 public health mandates that were imposed by the federal government? In general, yes. Okay. Um, and with respect to the RCMP, as I understand it, uh, you've been critical of how they handled the mass casualty event in Porta Peak, Nova Scotia in 2020. Is that fair? Yes, sir. Uh, several days after uh, that event had taken place, I reached out to some people that I I knew um, in the area and tried to get a sense of um, before I had just you know started speaking haphazardly without really having any you know in, in, as much information as I could, and then I released a video um, on YouTube which garnered roughly anywhere between five hundred thousand to a million views across various platforms um, in the in the following week. Um, I'm now going to ask you some questions about Diagalon. Um, again, referring back to the letter you sent to the Senate, you explained to them that Di Diagalon is a fictional country. Is that, is that, at least that's how its origin, is that fair? Uh, yes, sir. Right. Um, and from the material the commissions reviewed, uh, Diagalon, uh, the, the or origin of it was something you drew on your phone when you drew a line of over the continent of North America from the southeast to the northwest of the continent. Am I describing that correctly? Uh, yes. So the the concept was born out of a uh, sort of a long kind of stream of consciousness. I do a lot of um, analytical commentary on current events, politics, th these kinds of things. At the time, I believe it was January 2021, uh, the, I had observed, uh, as, as many others had, uh, the Midwestern United States, Texas, Florida, North South Dakota, and so on, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Alaska, um, geographically formed sort of an oblique line um, that were resistant to or handling the COVID-19 approach in a different way. These are traditionally conservative areas in Canada, Republican in the United States. So we, you know, kind of found it amusing that there, there was there was this kind of uh, geographical divide almost that you could find on a map and you know it became sort of a, of a joke that if this was a pretend place a different you know kind of parallel universe a different world and so on and um that's that's how the, the concept was born the, the the flag you're referencing is what i had created uh in the weeks following uh on my phone just as kind of a um as a as a mechanism for branding symbolism kind of thing for you know community members and it started to become synonymous with um myself and the podcast kind of as a as, a, as, as, as I guess a branding mechanism that people would you know display and, and uh, they could buy uh, patches, stickers, and, and, and things like this to uh, basically you know denote that they're a fan of mine. So and I and I take it from reading your letter to the Senate and what you just said, you don't take any issue uh, and you agree that you are associated with Diagalon and the Diagalon flag. Yes, it came out of my imaginations. Yeah, yes. Yeah, okay. And you talk about, you, you mentioned there, I think you said it, it, it began as a, as a bit of a joke, um, but as I understand it, that joke has now evolved into uh, an international community of your podcast fans. Is that fair? Yes, it's um, also fairly synonymous with uh, another, another thing that's been referenced, the you know, so-called Plaid Army, which was um, several, me and several other guys were just... Uh, Having a conversation one day, we all had similar shirts on. Someone made a joke about, you know, what is this, the Platte Army? So it was kind of, that evolved into this. It's essentially the same thing. It's the same uh, group of uh, people, and it's just a, uh, um, again, a, a kind of a branding mechanism, um, a way for, uh, to, to unite uh, community followers and so on. Right, and it's, you specifically reference in your letter to the Senate that it has created an international community of, 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 of your podcast fans. Is that correct? 
Yes, there are followers in, in fans in the United States, um, some in Europe, Australia. And as I understand, I stand from your letter that these uh, this community engages in regional meet and greets, barbecues, and family gatherings. Uh, yes, correct. Okay. Sometime in the uh, summer of 2021, I believe, um, we kind of hosted uh, just people wanted to come up and have kind of a meeting read with myself and some other guys. And uh, we had, as you said, a barbecue, um, you know, I had some drinks, some guys were playing guitars and so on. I observed that um, there was a, a few dozen people that came from as far away as uh, British Columbia, Ontario. Uh, we met in Saskatchewan and it struck me as um, in this time of a, a lot of people feeling very isolated and depressed, a lot of them expressed to me how, how much this meant for them to feel as though they had some kind of connection and, um, and, and kinship with other people that felt the same way as they did about, about the uh, about the future and shared their fears and concerns and so on. And I just observed how much it, it seemed to help them and heal them and, and make them happy. So I, I began what I call a find your friends campaign. So I used uh, using my uh, online presence and my Telegram channel and so on, uh, set up kind of uh, regional areas or, or chat channels to uh, facilitate by, I mean, not everyone can can come all the way to Saskatchewan from PEI, Newfoundland, or so on. So if there's people um, that are like-minded, that are in your area, that share these, that are a fan of, of my my podcast and so on, and you'd like to meet each other and, and share this kind of uh, this this kind of uh, activity, then you could do so uh, this way. I was just trying to create a a you know an avenue for them to to pursue, and I encourage people to do that rather than sitting at home looking at their screens and you know being fed. You know, fear and, and you know what I believe is a lot of uh, toxic messaging on the on the media and television and so on. And I thought it would be good for people to get out and you know have real face to face human interactions and, and relationships again. And I thought it'd be beneficial to their mental health. And I saw nothing but uh, you know good things coming from that. So I, I encourage people to do so. Okay, and uh, you mentioned a first or an, an initial meat barbecue in yeah. either the summer 2020, 2021. Um, after that, have you attended personally any of these other meet and greets that uh, you encourage people to participate in? There was one other one in, uh, in Saskatchewan that I was uh, present. There was another party sort of barbecue in, in uh, Ontario in perhaps April of this year. And there was um, another gathering uh, outside the city of Ottawa during the, uh, during the uh, convoy. Uh, period of time in February. And are there other ca former Canadian Forces members in the Diagolon community? Yes, there are. Um, I've often incorporated a lot of my commentary, my, my unique, I suppose you could say, uh, kind of lived experiences through through the military, My how I deal with my, uh, you know, the, the inherent trauma and so on that, that comes with that. It has gathered a, it has attracted a, a fair amount of um, other other veterans and, and military personnel because they resonate with the things that I'm saying. They, I'm speaking to something that they can understand or, or identify with. So there is there is a a, a fair number. I, I, would, I couldn't hazard a number specifically, but um, a sizable um, portion of the community, especially early on, where um, other guys that knew me from work or or, or so on, but uh, kind of spread through the, the areas um, because I'm an outspoken veteran and so on. Do you members of the Diagonal community ever refer to themselves as bigots? Yes, they do. Um, this was um, my doing um, to try and kind of take power out of the word um, as it was being used as a, as a slur, as a slanderous kind of de defamatory method to, uh, towards people like me and, and my followers and, and fans and so on. So um, we just kind of adopted as a, as a tongue in cheek kind of defiant way of, of shrugging it off is because it, it doesn't you know, bother us that these people are, if, if, you know, I show that it doesn't bother me, it shouldn't bother them and they shouldn't care what, you know, these people think, you know, they shouldn't let, allow them to, um, you know, a attack them in this way and get under their skin and make them feel bad just because they are who they are and they like what they like. So you and your followers were being called bigots. It didn't bother you, and so as a way to show it didn't bother you, you embraced it and identify yourself now as bigots. In a, in a tongue-in-cheek kind of sarcastic tone, yes. And is that sort of tongue-in-cheek sarcastic tone consistent with the sort of comedy that you perform on your podcasts? Uh, I would say that, yes, I'm a fairly sarcastic um, person, yes. And we already, you already mentioned uh, the Diagonal 
uh, symbol or flag, and I'm going to pull it up just to confirm everyone can see what we're talking about. If we can pull up COM906. And again, Mr. McKenzie, at any time, if you can't see anything that I've put up on the screen, just let me know. Um, yes, sir. So is that you in this photograph that's on the screen? Yes, it is. This was at a, um, one of the gatherings, I believe, outside of Ottawa sometime in February. Uh, I believe this is a still uh, image from a, from a video that was taken. I was standing on top of a table addressing the, uh, the people that had arrived and attended and was just simply thanking them for showing up and encouraging them to keep, you know, taking care of each other and, you know, hope they have a good time and so on. And uh, fair to say that uh, the, the flag in the background, that's a diagonal flag? Yes. Um, and uh, the commission is, uh, understands that on February 15th, uh, 2022, you said in a video that you could not wait until that flag is seen as a, or is, is, is described as a hate symbol. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, yeah, sir. Again, I was being um, kind of um, tongue in cheek in a way it, it, because the people that I believe are deciding what is and what is not as a hate symbol are uh, incredibly disingenuous and, um, you know, kind of smear merchants. Um, it was, would have been kind of a, kind of a gotcha trophy uh, over them, not as, not as actually in, in, in a serious manner displayed as a hate symbol, but more of a, more of a, um, you know, achievement that I, you know, kind of lured them in more to, uh, to focus on myself. And do you see, and, and, and I take it then that this is another sort of part of your comedy, call, wanting this to be called a hate symbol? Y yes, it's because it's, again, um, no one in my community would be surprised to hear me say these things, and it certainly isn't uh, a symbol of hatred, but we find it amusing that our, our um, I guess, enemies, if, if you could say, um, do, do believe this and, and believe these absurd uh, claims about us, and, and it's just kind of an inside joke at this point. You sell Diagalon merchandise, is that right? I personally, um, I have a, a shop that has just recently gone online in the past two or three months. Previously, other um, you know, friends of mine offered like the, uh, the flags, for example. Another man um, was selling uh, patches. He was making it cost just to help uh, promote uh, community visibility and give people something to... I thought it'd be nice for some people to have something to hold in their hand and kind of have them bring them some attachment and just something for them to enjoy and display. So the people who were selling the merchandise, they were friends of yours? Yes. They, uh, they sold it with your approval? Yes, they did. And they are also part of the Diagalon community? They would likely identify as, as fans of mine, and, and yes. Okay. Um, however... Um, as you can probably observe, it's not a particularly complicated uh, thing to pr produce. Um, so I don't. I, it's not a copyrighted symbol by any means. There's no real official uh, ownership to it uh, as of yet. So people would just approach me in, in of, of their own uh, you know, voluntary uh, intention and ask, like, "Hey, do you do you mind if I make this or make that and sell this, or, you know, for whatever?" And I would say, "You know, go ahead." If it gives you something to do, if you can make a few dollars from it and it helps you, then you know, by all means. Right. It's not it's not a nuanced symbol, is it, in terms of its design? No, it's essentially just a black square and I use my finger on my phone to do this about three times with a white uh, paint marker selection. And as you, you can see, it's kind of an irregular, it's not perfectly straight lines, they're kind of irregular and it, it is literally just my finger doing this a couple of times and I sent that uh, image file off to be produced from there. So if someone wanted to show themselves as someone who supported your podcast or supported the Diagalon community, it'd be fairly easy for them to replicate the Diagalon flag. Is that fair? I, I, would, I would assume so, yes. It's uh, not difficult to, uh, I mean, it looks fairly simple. So, uh, Mr. McKenzie, I think what I'm about to say will not come as a surprise to you, but in fairness, I want to ask you some questions about it. Um, of course. The RCMP has described you in documents the commission has received 
sorry, I should slip me back. The RCMP has described Diagonon, let me be specific, has described Diagonon as a militia-like network with members that are armed and preparing for violence. The RCMP has also described Diagonon as having supporters that express sentiments akin to accelerationism, viewing a coming collapse or civil war as necessary to right the course of the country. In your letter to the Senate, you denied those sorts of allegations. Is that fair? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, in the letter to the Senate, uh, you said that you are under RCMP scrutiny because of the criticisms that you've made about the RCMP. And as I understand reading your letter, but please correct me if I'm wrong, I understand, it, I understand you to be saying that the RCMP sort of uh, is 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 looking at you closely because of the way you criticize them, and that's why they're saying these sorts of things about you. That that is my personal belief. Yes, um, there is a um, most uh, many many of the the followers and uh, fans and so on are um, you could say conservative Canadians. There is um, an aspect of you know firearms, uh, sporting, recreational culture stuff, especially in Western Canada, um, but there's certainly not any anything resembling a militia or anything to this extent. Moving away from what the RCMP says about Diagonon, um, I appreciate you wouldn't have uh, been able to watch the testimony, but we had uh, Superintendent Patrick Morris, who is the uh, head of the OPP's Intelligence Bureau testify. He's not a member of the RCMP, and he testified at the inquiry that Diagonon is an extremist entity that holds extremist views. I assume you also disagree with that statement. Uh, yes, sir. It's um, my, again, belief and assertion that much of this um, this narrative is, is coming from certain uh, actors and members of the media. Uh, the Canadian Anti-Hate Network and so on has astroturfed and kind of laid the foundation of this, this idea. Um, they've been certainly paid me and a lot of attention over the past uh, few years. And through personal disclosure documents of mine, through various uh, legal uh, proceedings, it's um, been revealed that the police are actually relying upon articles, if you can call them that, by the Canadian Anti-Hate Network as open source intelligence. So they're relying upon what these people are saying about me as uh, you know, taking it at face value. But to be fair, Mr. McKenzie, you don't know what the RCMP or the OPP are relying on in their entirety when they make these assessments, do you? Correct. Um, I was going to ask you about two terms, one of which was the Platt Army, but thank you, you've already uh, uh, explained that, so we can save that question. The next term that uh, we've seen a reference to is a term that you've used sometimes called the beach, and um, it is our understanding, but again, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that when sometimes when you reference the beach, you're referencing D-Day in World War II. Is that accurate? Yes, it comes from a line in a, uh, a movie I, I enjoy, uh, Saving Private Ryan. There's a line in that, in that film right before the, the landing craft uh, descend upon uh, Omaha Beach, I believe, where uh, Tom Hanks' character says, I'll see you on the beach as kind of a reassuring, um, I'm, I'm, I will be there with you kind of sentiment. So I, I say this is, again, kind of, and you know, my followers are familiar with this. I've explained it several times, but that's just kind of a callback to that film. And to expressing a sentiment that you know what, whatever is transpiring in the future, will have, I will be I will be there with you to support you, and and you guys can support each other and so on. It's just a, a message of uh, encouragement, I suppose. Uh, you attended the protests in Ottawa in January and February two thousand twenty-two. Yes, sir. Okay. And you attended them with other members of the Diagalon community. Uh, yes, I did. When did you arrive in uh, Ottawa? I can't be certain of the exact date, but it was one or perhaps two days before the main body of the uh, of the trucks arrived. I believe it was a Friday evening they showed up. So, so, um, so maybe perhaps that Thursday or Wednesday. Okay. Um, so you knew the convoy was coming to Ottawa, and that's why you showed up. Uh, yes, I did. I, I observed the. It was very clear to me by monitoring social media and, and so on as, as part of what I do for to comment on social you know current events and you know analyze political commentary that kind of thing that this was going to be a very significant event it was very clear to me this was not going to be a in and out you know weekend protest type of thing there was videos of 
long, long, very long um, convoys of, of trucks and vehicles. They were descending, coming in from multiple directions. There were um, open group chats or, or uh, voice chats and stuff where these people were communicating back and forth. You could listen in on it. It was, it was clear it was going to be a, a pretty big deal. Um, so I, uh, again, this was going to be something I would be talking about and would have a lot of my attention anyway. So I decided why not go and, and get a, a, a close look at it as it transpired rather than watch it from, you know, relying on other sources from home to uh, understand what was happening. Right. And it attracted your attention because the, the stated purpose of the truckers coming to Ottawa was to end the federal COVID-19 mandates. And that's a, a political view you also held, right? That seemed to be one of their primary motivations, yes. Um, there was a lot of other, that was one of the main factors. There was a lot of other discontent in, in, in various groups. It wasn't, it wasn't a monolithic, that was the only uh, objective for people. Again, there was a very, not really any hierarchy or any real organization that I could observe. It very much seemed like just a grassroots kind of uh, movement of discontent with the federal government, with um, things that had been transpiring. The cost of living is, is, is rising social division, um, just a lot of the rhetoric uh, officials and stuff are using on television. A lot of people are very unhappy and having a difficult time over the past couple of years. And it um, basically, it was, I would describe it as, a, if I could use a metaphor, the pot had just simply boiled over. And uh, many people had decided that this was going to be the time that they were going to show up and exercise their right to peacefully demonstrate their, their discontent and their displeasure with the performance of the federal government. And when you arrived in Ottawa, you met people there who were members of Diagonal Community. Yes, sir. And presumably, if you met someone who hadn't heard of you or hadn't heard of Diagonal, you would tell them about it. You tell them about your podcasts and and encourage them to listen and support. Yes, if someone was unfamiliar, they asked a question. I would just simply say, "I, I am a, I'm a social media guy. I'm online. I have a, a podcast. It's political commentary, comedy, and, and some you know." analysis and, and, and this kind of thing. Um, if you're interested, I have, I have business cards that uh, somebody made up for me. I would hand them out to people and say, hey, this is the website if you'd like to check it out and so on. And, and you know, have, have a nice day kind of thing. And those business cards, they would have had the Diagonal logo on them? Uh, yes, on one side. Did those, sorry, it might have cut out. I asked you, did the business cards have the oh. Diagonal lo logo on them? Yeah, yes, they did. They have it on one side and then one of my other artistic logos on the other side with just simply the the website on uh, one side. And then I think it says find the others or find your friends on the other. And and you suggested this is something you do if someone came up to you. But um, I, is it fair to say, Mr. McKenzie, you're in the media business and you want to promote your media. So you would also actively hand out those cards? Uh, yes, sir. If someone, if someone asks or they're interested or they express a desire to learn like what, what it is I'm doing, it's just easier to just give them this. It directs them to the website. All of my social media links and so on are there. There's a short video. If they can go from there. If they like what they see, I presume they'll continue. If not, then so be it. Um, uh, did you attend at any point in the protest with a person named Alex Vrind or Vrend? Apologies if I'm mispronouncing the name. Yes, sir. And who is Alex Vrind? He is uh, someone I met online through... Um, through the evolution of my, my podcast, I suppose. I uh, met Alex in person in the summer of 2021, I believe. Um, we spent some time together in Saskatchewan as he was uh, traveling around the country, meeting people. And uh, as I understood, he was just kind of in between, you know, jobs in life and, and wasn't really sure what, he, he was just taking the opportunity to, uh, he bought a van and a dog and just kind of went on the, the classic Canadian road trip around the, around the country and was uh, meeting up with other people in the community that expressed a desire to, you know, meet them and, and you know, uh, hang out. And he'd become kind of more of a prominent, uh, prominent uh, person because of his, uh, he also is a content creator. He makes a lot of uh, memes and jokes and comedic things like this. And um, so people were interested to meet him. And, and his uh, content, he posts under the name Ferryman Stoll. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, and we understand uh, both from your letter to the Senate and some videos that your council has submitted that when you were in Ottawa, you encouraged peaceful protesting. Is that fair? Yes, sir. I, I was concerned, especially because of the rhetoric and, and verbiage coming out of, 
again, the Canadian Anti-Hate Network, which was being parroted, it's starting to be uh, picked up by other, other uh, more credible news outlets and so on, that I was concerned that if something should happen outside my control or, or you know, I, I can't really see the future, but I wanted to state very clearly what my intentions were and what I expected of people if they were going to be representing um, myself or, or brandishing any of my, I, I encourage them not to, because I wanted this to be about Canada, that, that this is about the country, bring a Canadian flag, this isn't about me, this isn't about, I'm not trying to sell anything. Um, this is more important, the bigger idea is more important. Um, but if you do, you know, happen to have, you know, something, please conduct yourself, you know, appropriately because your actions and um, decisions and things you say and you do will reflect upon me and the greater community and so on. So, uh, so, so just I, I wanted to have that in on the record before, just in case. So just, just to, to, to stop there. So uh, you wanted someone who was wearing a diagonal symbol to act accordingly. Um, as, it's not accordingly, but act as, as appropriately and peacefully. Um, at this point in time, were you aware that there, either the RCMP or other police agencies would be would maybe monitoring what you do or what your supporters do? Yes, sir. So you, when you're giving that direction, you're aware that the authorities are watching? I, I was under... I was never explicitly given um, any notice or, or no one had talked to me or, or spoken to anybody. It was, it was pretty clear just upon general observations, my own instincts, that this was, we were probably on, on the radar somewhere. So I didn't want um, anything to be misconstrued. I was trying to be very clear about my intentions and, you know, uh, you know, jokes aside, this is about, you know, protesting um, the government's performance and people exercising their rights to do so. I didn't want this to be misconstrued in any way. We were simply there to protest peacefully. I said things like, if you're, if there's a speed limit on walking for some reason, then you will walk slower than that. Don't even litter, don't spit, don't even throw a snowball. Don't give anyone any excuse to point at you and say that, look what you've done, look what you've you know incited or, or created or fomented and so on. Um, because that would have undermined the entire purpose of the of everything everyone was trying to achieve. So, Mr. McKenzie, I'm now going to read you one by one a list of names, and I may have some follow-up questions, but all I want to know right now is for each name whether or not you communicated with this individual while you were in, uh, either before you arrived in Ottawa or while you were in Ottawa. Okay? okay. You understand? Tamara, yes, Le sir. Tamara Leach. No, I... First um, spoke to Tamara Leach potentially in July of this year, July, August. Okay. Chris Barber. Um, not before. No. James Bowder. No. Bridget Belton. No. Benjamin Dichter. I'm aware of um, who Mr. Dichter is. I personally have not had any interaction with him. Um, I was aware that he was a some kind of alleged uh, manager of YouTube channels for where he would set up GoFundMes and name himself that, as a beneficiary. And Mr. McKenzie, I, I don't mean to interrupt, and, and, and it's just I, I want to make sure we get through it and you have time, and I just want to know sure. right now whether you communicated with these uh, people. Your counsel will have an opportunity if there's other things that, uh, that you want to bring up. Sure. Um, did you ever communicate either before or while you were in Ottawa with a Tom Marazzo? Uh, yes, I spoke to uh, Mr. Marazzo once, possibly twice over the phone, uh, once as I was driving back from Ottawa to uh, to the Maritimes to drop off some people that had accompanied me. They could only stay for a couple of days and have families and kids and so on. So um, I spoke to him for a couple of hours. We talked about you know our shared experiences in the military and so on. He indicated to me that he was in some capacity nearby um, something resembling people that were making decisions, I guess. Um, and basically just kind of connected in that, like someone suggested we should meet each other. And I expressed to him that if there was anything that um, I could do to, to help assist, get a message out or something that I, I was willing to do that. No one ever asked me to. And um, uh, likewise, I told him if I saw or was made aware of anything that I felt that that should be, that would be relevant that they should know about, that I would inform him and, and so on. But I think that was the extent of our, our interaction. I didn't uh, have any real meaningful interaction with Mr. Morazzo, I think, until around April when there was a benefit, uh, a, a fundraising dinner for the Veterans Freedom Organization right. in how, Burlington. In Ottawa, how many times did you speak with Mr. Morazzo? At least once, possibly twice. And when was the first time you spoke with Mr. Morazzo? It would have been sometime during the first uh, week, I believe. 
of when the trucks arrived. I was in the process. I remember I was driving my truck and it was over the headset. Um, the other guys were sleeping in the truck while we were talking. So some, somewhere in between Quebec and New Brunswick, I couldn't say. So sometime before January 28th? I'm not sure. I'm not sure of the dates of when the trucks arrived and when they left. But so, sorry, and, and 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 there's evidence of when the trucks arrived. But it was some point before the trucks yeah. arrived. Is that correct? No, it was after. It was after. How long after? I would say roughly a week. Roughly a week. Seven to ten. Seven to five to eight days, perhaps. Fair enough. When you were in Ottawa, did you communicate directly with any Ottawa police or OPP? Not to my knowledge, uh, I did have some friendly conversations on the street, you know, just, hi, how are you, how's it going, the cold out, you know, that kind of thing, but uh, nothing significant. No. Did you receive from okay. any, sorry, I think there's a, did you receive from any sources information about police operations or police enforcement plans while you were in Ottawa? Yes, there was a user that contacted me, I believe on Telegram, I would say again, summer of 2021, who self-identified himself as a uh, RCMP member, um, just kind of friendly, expressed to enjoy the podcast and like what I was saying and so on. So there was a, a loose relationship with this whoever this person was. Um, and during that time in Ottawa, they had reached out to me to inform me of uh, to say that uh, the POU, which I had to find, you know, if that was, I, I didn't understand the nomenclature of the Northern Police Officer, but I understood it to be the public order unit, the essentially the riot police um, were being um, activated to be, to be sent to Ottawa. Um, and further to that, after the Emergency Act had been invoked, uh, this person had sent me, um, well, there were, there were screenshots, I, I, I guess, of either a WhatsApp uh, group chat or a Telegram, I'm not sure. Of various RCMP officers engaging in uh, taking selfies of you know drinking and eating and so on and celebrating the uh, the the violence that they were bringing upon the the, the people downtown and, and saying uh, wait until they hear our jack boots and, and this kinds of thing. Um, he said that to me and I said, well, I, I, is this real? And they assured me yes. It seemed it looked very real. And I said, oh, well, I, I will publish this. And they said that's that's why we sent them to you. Um, so I did. I released that on Telegram and that you know went out. Um, since then, uh, that person has uh, deleted their account sometime in March, and I haven't been in contact with them since. Okay. Do you remember their name on Telegram? The the user handle was like GK or PK or something. It was two initials and a phone number. I think it was an Ontario area code, but other uh, than, beyond that, I didn't. Other than that user, did anyone else provide you with uh, information about police operations or enforcement plans? No. If we could pull up OPS, sorry, OPP 1668. And then if sorry, if we could go to page five, please. Keeps, uh, yeah, scroll down more. So this is an OPP intelligence brief, Mr. McKenzie. Um, you may have seen it with respect to some of the disclosure we provided, but I, I assume you, have, you wouldn't have seen the document before today. Um, I'm gonna ask you, uh, if you look at item two, uh, it says, well, so actually for context, look at item one. Um, it talks about a video posted to, the name is redacted, but it says the name of the Instagram account, it says Raging Dissident. So that, that would be you, Mr. McKenzie? Yes, sir. As far as you know. And then item yes. two, again, talks about a video posted to the Raging Dissident account in which uh, uh, the poster uh, shares information credited to police sources that disclose enforcement plans, and then it provides a bit of a description. Is that the information that the user on Telegram provided you? Yes, sir. Okay. On the same day, on the same page, if you look at item three, uh, it talks about on February 8th, um, a user uh, posted two videos to his Telegram channel, Rageboard. Is that your Telegram channel? That was one of the previous names of it, yes. Okay. 
And if you look there, if you there's a line break, and then it says, again, name redacted, says there's supposed to be some negotiations taking place with a government delegate, but he hasn't heard how it went from organizers yet. Yet, he goes on to state. Do you see that? Uh, no, sir. Sorry, let me, I'm, I'm talking a little quickly. I'll oh, yes, yes. Yeah, do you, yes. Sorry, and, sorry. And take your time. I want to make sure that you're reading this uh, before I ask you questions. Um, so this suggests that... Uh, um, you were aware that um, there might be negotiations with a government delegate, but you hadn't heard from the organizers yet. Do you know that that's a reference to? I can't recall. I, I, I remember being under the impression that there was some form of negotiations taking place between um, some sort of uh, leadership apparatus for the, the uh, convoy and the perhaps city city of Ottawa, RCMP, OPP, not sure, the, the police and the, the convoy people. Fair enough. Um, How did you learn that information? That is a good question. I think it may have just been kind of common knowledge that there was something like that was taking place. More of a rumor, perhaps. Um, the As it goes on, yeah, the, the public order unit. I was that was in, that was uh, given to me specifically by this uh, by this user on Telegram from the RCMP. Alleged that they allegedly they were right. And you're talking then about the part that's in bold after that. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, are you aware that Tom Morazzo met with C City Manager Steve Kanalakis on February eighth, two thousand twenty-two? No, sir. Did Mr. Morazzo ever talk to you about meeting with Mr. Kanalakis or meeting with any government officials in any of the conversations you had? No, he did not. Okay. Have you ever spoken with Keith Wilson or Eva Chipiak? No, sir. Okay. We can take that down. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, Mr. McKenzie, I think you think agree with me. It's fair to say that you were critical of the federal government's response to the protests in Ottawa and Coots. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. Um, initially, uh, it was I, I had no uh, no issue. Actually, I thought it was handled very appropriately. There was a, uh, a strong police presence, but as also there was a large number of people. Um, so inherently, there is a danger that there's uh, going to be you know something can happen. So it, it made sense. Um, I didn't take any issue with uh, anything that I they had uh, seen until um, they started becoming a little more aggressive here and there. There was a, an incident where some fuel cans were stolen or seized or, or what have you. Um, but it wasn't really until the, the EMA was invoked that they became extremely aggressive and violent. And uh, that that is that was that was what I, I took the most issue with. Um, did you ever say that the RCMP was intentionally cutting truckers off from essential supplies in Ottawa and Coots? That is what I had been hearing from people, yes. And so, and did you then repeat that on your podcast? I may have, yes. Did you ever say that the RCMP made attempt to disrupt cell phone towers to ensure truckers cannot communicate? That, again, was another um, another. Uh, scenario, there were people having a lot of issues with their cell phones. Um, that may or may not have been the conduct of some kind of interference. It could have just been too many cell phones and enough towers. I'm not sure, but that again was another kind of running uh, suspicion and theory at the time. Fair enough. My question right now is, is if you recall, if that's something you said on your podcast, that that was something that had been, was being said. <laughs> I may have, yeah. And did you ever say on your podcast uh, that, uh, or did you, sorry, let me back up. <coughs> did you ever distrib distribute or know of anyone distributing uh, contact information about the members of the Ottawa Police Service? Not to my knowledge, no. We can pull up <coughs> ssm.nsc.can.00001575 underscore rel.001. Zero one. <laughs> Apologies for all those digits, Mr. McKenzie. Um, okay. So scroll up to the top, please, just so I can uh, give the witness some context. So, Mr. McKenzie, this is a CSIS analytical brief uh, dated February 21st, 2022. And if we could go to page three of the brief, please.
and scroll down a bit further, please. Scroll down a little bit further, please. So this, this part of the brief says that uh, since the initial weekend, key figures within Diagalon have made appeals for participation in and documentation of the demonstrations. Further, Vreend has been collecting donations to allow others to travel to participate in demonstration in Coots, Alberta, or Ottawa, Ontario. Do you see that? Yes, sir. Uh, do you have any knowledge about whether or not Mr. Vreen was collecting donations to allow uh, people to participate in both Coots and Ottawa? Uh, I recall he was collecting some funds for someone. I don't think it was just in general open to whoever wanted them. I think, I think there was one or two people potentially from Western Canada that expressed a desire to come down to Ottawa, but they couldn't afford it. So I, th I think that was roughly what was going on there. I wasn't directly involved. I can't recall entirely, but I think that's what was going on. And then if we could scroll up in this document to the, sorry, the next page up. Sorry, sorry, keep scrolling up. Stop there. So this, again, uh, uh, this is a, a CSIS, uh, a document, um, but it has a, a box here that says, in Jeremy McKenzie's own words, um, it's the first one says, this is, the good guys versus the bad guys. The showdown has finally fucking begun, and it has begun in Canada. You could, uh, you could go be a part of the story now. Is, is that something you've said? It sounds like something I said, yes. Um, and is that something you've said with respect to the protests in either Ottawa or Coots? Probably, I believe so, yes. And then the next quote is, this is the beach, get yourself out there. Is that something you said with respect to the protests in either Ottawa or Coots? Probably, yes. Okay. And in this case, when you're using the beach, are you referring to the analogy we spoke about with D-Day? I was referring to the, the idea that this, again, a lot of people had felt very powerless and, and disenfranchised, upset, depressed, and th this, was, this was an opportunity for them to actually go and participate and have their voices be heard. and. and Join, join these demonstrations. And, and rather than sitting at home complaining and whining about it on the couch, they could, you know, if you, if you can, why, why, are, why not? Why not go and, and be involved? And, I, and I've heard you say that, Mr. McKenzie. I'm asking you if in this case, when you're using the word beach, if you're, it's using it in the same context when you're alluding to D-Day. And the reason I'm asking you this is you know that uh, the police and, and the government view you, view your group as potentially as extremist, and so this is the sort of thing that would grab their interest. So when you're talking about beach, you're talking about D-Day, is that right? I was trying to uh, speak directly to my audience that are familiar with uh, my verbiage, my, my kind of terminology and, and things I reference in the way that they would understand that this is, this is something important that, you know, we should, you know, you can do together. It's not, uh, I didn't, certainly didn't mean it in any kind of violent context or D-Day invasion type scenario. I just simply meant it as an encouraging kind of call to the community at large that, uh, hey, you know, if this is something, um, you know, you could be involved in rather than just, again, sitting at home by yourself. So, Mr. Clerk, you can uh, take that document down. Thank you. I now have some questions for you, Mr. McKenzie, about the protests in Coots. Um, <clears throat> just f first, simple yes or no, did you ever travel to Coots personally? No. Uh, did you know anyone who was protesting in Coots in February 2022? I was aware that uh, Mr. Chris Lysak was there, and I and loosely acquainted with uh, Mr. Adam Skelly, who had made a couple of trips there to deliver steaks and brisket and so on. Um, There's a couple of comedians in the Edmonton and Calgary area that I know that traveled down to put on some uh, a performance, I think, and then just kind of meet and greet and leave, and that was about it. Uh, what were the names of the two comedians? It was uh, uh, Brendan Blackier and uh, Sam Walker, or did... Maybe I'm not sure if Sam attended, but uh, Brendan for sure. And uh, there was also uh, Brett Forte, who I don't know personally. I've never spoken to him. Um, I was just made aware that they were there because they posted a video of them traveling there to say hi to everybody. And so uh, Chris Lysak, uh, uh, Mr. S uh, Adam Skelly, uh, Brendan and Sam, are they members of the Diagalon community? No. 
they, they may identify as fans. Uh, Mr. Lysak would. Um, Brendan probably would. Uh, Sam, potentially. Mr. Forte, I've never met um, or spoken to. If you're a fan of Diagalon, you're part of the community, right? Again, it's just kind of self-identifying. You could say it's as simple as, you know, ident as identifying as a Toronto Maple Leafs fan by putting a sticker on your truck. Um, it's really... It's really that simple. So the answer to my question is yes. I suppose so, yes. Were you communicating with the individuals you just uh, identified while they were in Coots? No. How do you know Chris Lysak? Uh, Mr. Lysak has been a longtime uh, fan of the podcast. Um, I met him personally in Saskatchewan uh, in the summer of 2021. I believe that first first uh, uh, meet and greet get together I mentioned, and a subsequent one uh, later in the year, perhaps September. Um, there was a few dozen people. Um, we you know had a beer and a steak, you know, with with all these people. Took a photograph together at one of the, one of them, and uh, that's pretty much it. Did you talk to him when you were at either of those two meet and greets? Yes, I talked to uh, dozens of people, yeah. yeah. Chris and was I, one of them. And I take it the topic of conversation at these meet and greets include the sim similar topics that you discuss on your podcast. Is that fair? Um, I generally don't like to engage in that. Uh, I find it kind of exhausting, and I try to just make it keep it kind of a social, you know, meet and greet, uh, you know, casual kind of uh, social event. I don't, I don't really try to talk politics or, or anything like that. Um, but, but, per, but, presumably, but presumably your fans, when they meet you in person, they want to talk to you about what they, they hear you talking about in your podcast. That's fair, isn't it? Sometimes, yes. Yeah. Can we pull up uh, COM50907? Uh, So, Mr. McKenzie, um, can you please identify the people in this photo? Yeah, that's uh, that's the photo I, I just mentioned. I posted it to my Instagram page. It's myself on the on my left and uh, Mr. Lysak on the right. Right. And this was this at the first event in Saskatchewan? I believe so. Yes. Okay. And just to be clear, Mr. McKenzie, other than that event in Saskatchewan and uh, uh, and then the other event in September 2021, is there any other times you've met with Mr. Lysak? No. Did you communicate with him at any time other than at those events? Um, Mr. Lysak may have been in some larger uh, online group chats where there's 30, 40 other people involved. Um, never, to my knowledge, never directly one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. He has called me twice i think since he's been incarcerated um just simply to say hi and i just try to offer some offer some encouragement to him and hope that he's doing well etc so you spoke to him after his arrest in coots yes sometime this summer okay um and i asked you generally about the people you identified who you knew in coots but with respect to mr lysak specifically did you understand him to be a fan of your podcast yes sir and you understood him to be a member of the Diagalon community? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, are you aware that Mr. Lysak, or at least there's been reports that Mr. Lysak had a Diagalon flag flying outside the house in which he lived with his father? I have heard that, yes. Yeah. So if we could pull up COM 917. And so, uh, have you ever read this article that's on the screen, Mr. McKenzie? Um, I may have. It's uh, tough to recall. It's an it's an article in the Toronto Star, and you're quoted in it. Do you remember giving uh, a quote to the Toronto Star with respect to an article they were writing about Mr. Lysak? I think so. I've spoken to the Toronto Star several times, yes. Okay. And if you could go down to page three, just so I can show you, just... Um, You'll see in the middle of the page, it says, when reached by the star this week, Mackenzie said in an email that he'd met Chris along with thousands of people 
by now through my podcast and travels around the country, which is as you explained. So we can take that down. Mr. McKenzie, are you aware that on February 14th, the RCMP executed a search warrant in Coots, Alberta and arrested 13 people. And as a part of that arrest, they seized uh, several weapons and body armor. Is that something you're aware of? Yes, sir. And how did you become aware of that? I uh, was made aware of it by once it uh, hit the media either that evening or the following day. Okay. Um, and when did you become aware that Mr. Lysak was one of the people who was arrested? It was right around the same time that uh, word had spread around the community that he had been arrested was as part of the 13 or, or whoever many other people were arrested. And are you aware that Mr. Lysak was charged with conspiracy to murder, uttering threats and possession of a weapon? Yes, sir. After the arrests, as the commission understands it, you posted a video in Ottawa where you talked about the people who'd gotten arrested in Coots. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, yes, sir, I think so. What I'll do is I'll pull it up. I'm not gonna play it for you because of our time, but if, if you can identify it as, as, as a video that you participated in, that would be helpful. Uh, COM okay. uh, 50 is 911. Actually, we might just play the first maybe 30, 30 yes, seconds or so. Ryan Tyke, if you're not, if you just want to give a shit, please, in your thoughts, keep the boys in Alberta. They got arrested. We haven't heard from them. We don't know what's going on. Uh, there's some rumors they're, they're getting fucking charged with some heavy shit. I don't know what's going on there. I, I don't know. I know as much as you do. But okay, I don't you can stop that. it there. So is that a video you posted, Mr. McKenzie? Yes, that appears to be a clip um, from one of my podcast episodes, probably shortly after that had taken place. Um, at the time, and still presently, uh, I'm very skeptical of law enforcement, um, especially considering the political nature in which there appears to be a lot of interference going on in the country. Um, I was concerned that uh, from that aspect uh, of what was happening out there, um, again, um, I don't know anything other than what's been posted in the media and uh, what's been said uh, other than that they've been charged with uh, what they've been charged with. Um, of course, if it uh, evidence does uh, appear or is presented that uh, proves that these allegations are in fact correct, obviously that is something I would denounce. I don't uh, stand by that. As I've said, this is not something that is uh, supported by myself. It would undermine the entire uh, purpose of, of, these, of these protests. Um, and until then, I, I hope they get a, a fair trial and, and we'll see what happens. And, and, and you're correct, Mr. McKenzie, the matter is before the courts. Um, and so it is yet to be uh, adjudicated in the appropriate setting. Um, the sure. media reports are uh, that the people were arrested. Um, there was concern by the police that some of them were intending to use the weapons uh, to harm police officers or murder police officers. Again, that is going to be dealt with another matter. But I assume if if that was someone's intent, you would denounce it. Is, is that, did I hear that correctly? Absolutely, yes. Um, in the video, you can take it down, thank you, Mr. Clerk. You mentioned the boys in Alberta uh, when you're talking about the rest. Other than Mr. Lysak, do you know anyone else who got arrested in Alberta? No, sir. I'm just, to be, to be clear, I'm gonna read you the names and I just want, want you to say yes or no, yes, I know them, no, I don't know them. Ursula Gwen Allred? No. Luke Burke? No. Christopher Dean Carbert or Carbert? No. Evan Banning Colnut? No. Johnson Chi Chow Law? No. Jacqueline Francis Martin? Uh, Ms. Martin, I did have a conversation with maybe in June or July. I think she uh, was in one of these uh, video chats and introduced herself and mentioned that she was, um, or maybe that wasn't her, Martin? And, and, and Mr. McKenzie, okay. just to stop you there, I, I'm interested in people you knew as, of, Fe time? as of February 14th, yes. 2022. Okay, um, yeah, no. Justin Lyle Martin? No. Jerry Mitchell Troy Moran? No. Easton Stewart Oler? Anthony George Olianek? No. 
Joanne Lynn Person? No. Jenks Anthon Zaremba? No. Okay. Um, Mr. Commissioner, I'm almost done. If I could have a few more minutes, please. Okay. Uh, Mr. McKenzie, I'm sure you are no doubt aware that uh, the RCMP released photos of the, the weapons and body armor they seized. Um, and uh, why don't we pull up uh, two photos first with COM 915. And if we could just scroll out, and this is just to give you some context, Mr. McKenzie, this is the larger photo showing the weapons and the ammunition and the, uh, the, the vests that were received. And then if we could pull up COM 916, and what I'm gonna show you is a photo that's zooming in on the vest that if you're looking at the photos to the right, I expect you know uh, what I'm going to show you at this point, Mr. McKenzie. So yes, this was this is a zoom in of of the photo we're looking at, and that's one of the pieces of uh, that's a ballistic vest, as I understand it. Is that correct? Uh, it appears to be some some kind of tactical vest. Um, if it was ballistic, it would have to have some kind of uh, ballistic plates or, or Kevlar or something it's inserted into it. It's not clear. Right. Fair enough. Um, you see on there, there's two patches with the diagonal symbol. Correct. Yes, it does appear that that is the case. However, um, I was made aware of this shortly after this took place. And uh, after some scrutiny and, and taking a closer look at the photos, they don't appear to be, as I said, there was a man in uh, Prince Edward Island who was making these and, and selling them at cost to whoever. Thousands of these uh, went out across uh, Canada, some to the United States, some to Australia. Um, these ones, however, appear to be homemade or made by someone else as as of now, I, I don't recall anyone coming forward to say that they had produced these or where these came from. Um, uh, so I can't really speak to it as their origins. Right, but you you agreed with me earlier, Mr. McKenzie, that any one of your fans or anyone who was in the Diagalon community who supported you could very easily made a patch that looks just like that. Isn't that right? Yes. If we could pull up, and this will be the last document, Mr. Commissioner, pb.nsc.can dot zero 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 eight five zero eight underscore r e l dot zero 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 one so mr mckenzie again this is a, a document this one's from the rcmp k division and it's a a form of report about um uh, the, the arrest that we've been talking about in Coots, Alberta. And if we can scroll down to where it says current situation, uh, it says in the second bullet point, a ballistic vest was seized during the search warrant at the residence in Coots, which contained a patch reflective of the Diagalon flag. It is believed that this vest belongs to one of the accused, Christopher Lysak. Open source information has linked Lysak to red-acted name. So, Mr. McKenzie, this isn't your report. I know you didn't produce it, but... You would agree with me that from the RP, RCMP's perspective, they believe that the vest with the dialog, diagonal symbol was Mr. Lysak's, correct? That does appear to be Sorry, what they believe, uh, yes. Yes, wait a moment. Sorry, your counsel had an objection, so. Yes. It's unfair to this witness to ask him to speculate what uh, the, is in the RCMP's mind and their perspective about intelligence. Uh, I think maybe the question wasn't that well framed, but... The, the quote speaks for itself. He, he could ask whether he agrees with with the quote uh, is 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 on the RCMP letterhead. I mean, it's really not much further than that. I take it. No, I, I actually withdraw the question, Mr. Okay. Commissioner. I agree that he has no uh, uh, he, he he doesn't know why the RCMP made their observations. So I agree with that, and I withdraw it. And those are my questions. Thank you. Okay. So uh, now uh, we'll. Go with the first, the convoy organizers. The convoy organizers are ceding their time to Mr. McKenzie's council, sir. Okay. Uh, Government of Canada. Good afternoon, Mr. McKenzie. My name is Stephen Aylward. I'm one of the lawyers for the Government of Canada. Hello. Uh, Mr. McKenzie, you described uh, Diagalon as a grassroots community. Do I have that right? 
Um, no, I wouldn't say it's, it's grassroots. It's spraying from, from my imagination. And uh, I create the, the, the content from which the, the uh, lore and amusement and entertainment and so on attracts people to, to it in which they will then either self-identify as a fan or not. Okay, and you've described yourself as the de facto leader of Diagalon? No, that's not correct. I've never described myself in that manner. That's a that's been put forward into the media again by people at the Canadian Anti Hate Network. Again, this is a, a figment of my imagination in a in a fictional world. I, I see. So the, the, uh, the, can't really lead a, a fictional world exactly. The, the letter to the Senate that the Commission Council brought up earlier, you had described yourself as a de facto leader in quotes. I take it then you're, you're saying that was being used yeah. ironically in that context. Yes, I was trying to to identify myself as the person in question that the Senate was um, debating about, and and the House of Commons were talking about, uh, which alarmed me. And uh, I was acting in the interest of protecting um, not only myself but other people that identified as fans and followers of mine. And it was clear that this was a uh, an issue of national importance, and I felt obliged to say something about it rather than um, ignore it. Right. And you have no formal authority over anyone who's uh, part of the Diagalon community, is that right? That's correct. There, there's no hierarchy, there is no uh, rank system, membership, code of conduct, uniforms, anything like this. It's a very informal, uh, again, I would pose it as if you're a fan of the, the Calgary Flames or Montreal Canadiens or not or something. It's just as simple as saying you like it or you don't. Okay, and you, you view yourself as uh, somewhat of a calming presence within the Diagalon community? No, I, I would view myself as the, the, I guess, central figure from which the rest of it sort of orbits. Okay, you're, uh, earlier you agreed with Commission Council that you had put out messages urging people in Ottawa not to use violence or to act unlawfully. You agree with that? Correct. I, I do use my platform to uh, try my best to, again, put put forward messages and, and, and that's I guess, uh, responsible uh, messaging, yes. And you were putting out those messages because you were concerned that some members of the Diagalon community would use violence or would act unlawfully. My concern was that something could happen uh, outside of my control, and I would rather have had say something on record of what I would expect people to, you know, to behave uh, lawfully and peacefully, um, so that they, if they follow me and listen to me, and they've heard that, and then chosen to act on their own and, and do something, um, something outside the desires of, you know, myself, then that's. Um, not really something I can control. I can't control what other people want to do, but I did want to make it clear that this was this was my intention was a peaceful demonstration. And uh, you explained that you, there were other members of the Diagalon community with you in Ottawa at the time of the Freedom Convoy? That's correct. How many would you say? Um, there was a, um, a property that uh, we were staying at outside the city limits that had been offered up by, by someone who um, was a fan, he had a, a vacant uh, building, no furniture, but you know, it's got a roof, it's got heat, so you could stay there. At times there were three or four or five of us, other times as many as 20. And were there other people that you saw in Ottawa with Diagalon uh, symbols who weren't part of that group? I didn't personally observe any, uh, one one individual I did see that had, had a flag, but outside of that, I didn't see any, uh, any symbolism or flags or patches or so on. I did encounter a number of people that recognized me and wanted to have a, a picture and, and talk and shake hands and so on. Um, uh, could we please call up ssm.nsc.can.6079? Underscore REL.0001. Um, Mr. McKenzie, are you aware of reports that members of the Plaid Army put out a, a YouTube video in which they expressed the hope that the uh, Freedom Convoy in Ottawa would be the Canadian version of the January 6th riot in Capitol Hill? I believe I, I know the, the clip that you're referring to, which is, again, taken out of uh, context of a much larger uh, 
uh, presentation broadcast of which I was not uh, party to. Um, obviously, um, I can't speak to that person's intentions or, or what they meant by that, but um, I will reinforce that, I, again, it was not my intention to see any kind of violence, political violence, or, or, or anything like that, because it, again, undermines the intentions and uh, you know, objectives of the, of the protesters, which was to peacefully demonstrate their discontent. Thank you. Uh, if we could actually pull up the next uh, documents, a uh, uh, video, uh, pb.can.40s1820 underscore REL.0001. And if we could start the video at the 55 second mark, please. But just while we're calling that up, um, you, you're aware that there was a deal that was struck between some of the protest organizers in Ottawa and the city of Ottawa? I don't believe so, no. Okay. So we need the... Council, if you'll just allow a brief indulgence, uh, we're having a bit of difficulty locating that. Uh, maybe I'll move on to the next topic and then I'll come back to that. Um, in terms of the uh, Coots incident that uh, Mr. Mather was just discussing with you, uh, were you aware that there were a number of individuals who traveled from Ottawa to uh, who were at the Freedom Convoy event in Ottawa, who then traveled to Coots? No, sir. And uh, in particular, to clarify, I'm referring to individuals who were charged as part of that RCMP operation. No, sir. When Just a moment ago, uh, when you were describing the, uh, we were looking at a photo of a, uh, uh, some sort of uh, body armor that had the uh, diagalon symbol on it, and you, you were expressing some concerns yeah. about the authenticity of the diagalon uh, symbol there. Uh, just to be clear, were you suggesting that uh, the diagalon symbol had been planted there by law enforcement? Uh, again, uh, at the time and still, I am skeptical of um, of the RCP in particularly, but uh, law enforcement in Canada, there is a history of things like this taking place, um, it's not outside the realm of possibility that something like that is very easily replicated, could be planted. I'm not suggesting that it certainly has or has not, but I would leave that open to possibility, yes. I take it there's still some issue in pulling up that video? Correct, counsel. Is it going to be a while, or should uh, should uh, this be put off to a little later? Um, this may take a little while, Commissioner. Okay. So maybe if if you're agreeable, uh, you can complete your examination subject to this video, and we can slot you in uh, a little bit in maybe ten minutes, whenever this is sorted out. Yes, that's fine. Is it, I, I did have one other video clip that I wanted to play. Um, is it possible to pull up? Um, the uh, a different video clip? Uh, sure, Council. I can assist uh, if you have the doc ID. I'll... Yes, okay. It's COM50911, the video that was played earlier. And if we could just start that around the 30 second mark. Federal agent. When there isn't anything I want. <laughs> oh, 
see you when I see you. And I'm up over like enough for to do what I can do. Cheers, guys. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, I hope you had a good time. I hope you feel better. All you truckers out there, all you guys, hold the fuck down. Nobody's going anywhere. You're not, you're not scaring anybody. You want to fucking dance? Let's dance. Force a tyrant to act like one. And oh, did we succeed in that? I want to play you this video. Uh, this um, uh, it's from my, my good dear friend Greg Arcade. You're a legend and a, and a, a wonderful man. Uh, I love you, brother. Thank you so much for the work that you've done and continue to do for this country and your people. Uh, you're an underrated person, and uh, in the words of the ferryman's toll. Uh, uh, and so earlier you mentioned that there were some videos in which you had urged people in Ottawa uh, not to use violence, not to. Uh, act uh, unlawfully. Do you view your comments, uh, you, you want to dance, let's dance, or uh, hold, uh, I believe it was, hold the fuck down? Uh, do you view those comments as in line with, uh, with your earlier messaging? There was my intention to uh, convey that the, the protesters and the, the demonstrators had no intention of relinquishing their right to peacefully demonstrate. It was clear at the time that the rumblings and, and things I'd been hearing and seeing that it was the intention of the federal government to use uh, to use force to dispel these people. So, as I said in the video, and I've been saying for, for a long time, is, you know, to force a tyrant to act like one, you simply um, refuse to to, um, to 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 bend to their will, and, and they will reveal themselves to be who they are. And in this case, they deployed the uh, RCMP and various police forces and, and beat people with batons and shot them with tear gas canisters and trampled an indigenous uh, elderly woman with a horse. Another man was dragged lifelessly through a crowd and so on. So that was the price that uh, people were willing to pay and endure uh, for for the Canadian people to show them um, the true face of what it was they were standing against. Okay, thank you. Uh, subject, oh. if I might ask for just two uh, minutes later to address that issue with the video. I, I, I think it's that. now available. Oh, it so, is. So, Council, I believe it's been renumbered to poe.doj. Six zero one four. Okay, understood. it's an eight-minute-long video, correct? Yes, that's right. Okay, uh, if we could start it at the fifty-five-second mark, please. <laughs> um, I'm sure a lot of people have have been seeing this. Randy Hillier has spoken about this already. Um, Tomorrow, allegedly, there's some kind of deal being signed or agreed upon by, you know, the quote-unquote uh, truckers uh, with the city, with the government, however, where they're going to move some vehicles and relocate and this kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> it's been expressed to me by by people, you know, connected inside the inside the uh, the movement there to, to the actual truckers um, that. The, the, this 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 leadership cell of uh, you know political operatives like uh, Dichter and Dagny um, are are not playing. Uh, they're not on. They're not on side, guys. They I was told they haven't released a dime of the money at all. Um, these guys are sitting out there. You know they're they're paying. They got nine thousand dollars a month to making these payments on these trucks, and they're not they're not getting paid. Um, you know they're missing mortgage payments now. Um, and this this deal tomorrow is uh, fraudulent. Um, a lot of the names that are attached to it, um, oh, people now. you know have have. Uh, so does, I, I mentioned a deal earlier between protest organizers in the city. Does that video does that refresh your memory about that issue? Uh, yeah, apologies a, a bit. I was unclear as to what you what you were referring to. It's something. It, I think there was a some kind of negotiation was taking place to move some trucks from one place to another. Um, I don't again. I wasn't intimately involved. I don't know exactly the details of that, but um, to some extent, I, I, I'm not uh, not sure exactly. Safe to say, you were urging your followers not to go along with that deal. I was expressing concern because at that time um, there was a number of names that had appeared that somehow had. Uh, gotten into the leadership cadre or something as, as you could describe that i was very skeptical of their intentions and i had some skepticism and fear that this was uh 
so things were moving in a, in, a, in a malicious direction. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next, I think it's the uh, uh, Ottawa Coalition of Residents and Businesses. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. McKenzie. I'm not sure if you can see me there. Uh, my name is Paul Champ. I'm a lawyer for the Ottawa Coalition of Residents and Businesses, the people from downtown Ottawa. Um, just have a couple of questions for you. Um, you mentioned uh, in your testimony about getting um, the screen captures of, of text, uh, group texts uh, from RCMP officers. You got that from a current RCMP member, is that right? At the time, it was... Um delivered to me. I understood that to be the case. I can't speak to if this person is still employed or not. Okay. And um, do you occasionally yeah. have interactions uh, of people who are fans or are interested in what you say or supporters uh, who are current uh, members of law enforcement? Yes, that's correct. And uh, while you were in Ottawa, were you, uh, during the, the convoy protest, were you in communication with some of these uh, individuals who are current law enforcement members and are supporters of yours? Um, not, uh, not directly, no. And have you ever been uh, um, in contact with or anyone communicated to you who are, is a current member of the Canadian Security Intelligence Service who's a supporter of you or a fan of you? <laughs> Uh, no, I've actually made um, numerous overtures and offers to speak to the Canadian Security Intelligence Service to try to um, shed some light on, on you know, myself and this community that they seem so concerned about. And as of today is the first day that I've ever been asked a single question by anyone in any official capacity about it. Right. Uh, and you mentioned that uh, you had... Um three or four people, or sometimes as many as 20 people staying with you in the same location in Ottawa, is that right? Correct, yes. And those were up to 20 people who were uh, uh, supporters or fans of yours? Yes, that's correct. And uh, some of these people were uh, former uh, members of the military or current members of the military? <sighs> Veterans like I yourself? do not think so. Um, I'd have to go through a list and refresh my memory, but no, no one's jumping out at me. I don't think so. I believe they're all uh, civilians. Okay. Uh, did any of them? Uh, uh, did any of them uh, bring any firearms with them? Uh, no, sir. I actually went out of my way to make sure that was adamantly very clear that that would uh, not be something I would I would uh, endorse, and is not a good idea. And again, it would be a very dangerous situation. It's illegal, and it's undermining. Um, the objectives of the protesters. For sure. Um, yeah, you were concerned about that, right? That um, some some people in the protest uh, might undermine the purpose of the protest by becoming violent. You didn't want, want that to happen, correct? That's correct. And that's why you made that message out to people to, to not be violent, is that right? Yes, sir. Because you, you knew some of the people who were there could be volatile and could be uh, violent, is that right? I understand that uh, in great numbers of people and tens of thousands of people, there is uh, always going to be outliers of folks who, you know, may be unhinged, they may be mentally ill, there could be any number of factors that may uh, contribute to something. And, and I was just doing my best to mitigate any potential, any influence that I have um, to try to, you know, push things in a, in a positive direction rather than, you know, say nothing or, or worse, contribute to, you know, something uh, negative happening. And um, when you were in Ottawa, did you have contact with uh, Mr. Randy Hillier? I met with Mr. Hillier um, once, maybe twice. Um, he didn't have much of a voice. He was uh, feeling under the weather, but yeah, I, I met him once or twice. While you were in Ottawa? Correct. And... Um, when you got the information about the RCMP text, did you pass that on to anyone uh, in the convoy uh, leadership? Uh, no, sir. I looked at it. I, I 
sat with it for about 10 minutes and I just uh, decided to publish it on my Telegram page for everyone to look at. And from there, it went to uh, counter signal. Key and Bexty, Rebel News took it, uh, various other um, various other independent journalists and so on took, uh, took note of it. Uh, notably, the legacy media, CBC and so on, did not uh, comment or provide any coverage or insight of that, but uh, I simply just put it out there and it you know, went off on its own into the wild. And uh, you you met with Mr. Hilliard. Did you meet with any other um, elected uh, political officials uh, while you were in Ottawa during the convoy protests? Uh, no, sir. Either federally or provincially? Not to my knowledge, no. And uh, you'd indicated in your testimony that uh, you met Miss uh, Tamara Leach this summer? I spoke to her on the phone. I did see Tamara Leach briefly. She walked by me um, somewhere in a hotel lobby. Uh, but I hadn't had any formal interaction, conversation, or anything with her until I spoke to her on the phone sometime in, I want to say, August. And the two of you, uh, you were discussing, uh, what was what was the topic you were discussing, the upcoming inquiry or other issues? No, she had actually called to express uh, concern and, and, and so on for my uh, legal situation. For your legal situation? Yes, outside of, the, of this. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. McKenzie. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, the uh, Ottawa Police Service. Good afternoon, Mr. McKenzie. My name is Jessica Barrow, and I'm counsel for the Ottawa Police Service. Can you see and hear me all right? Yes, I can. Hello. Excellent. Um, I'm going to start with something that you testified to earlier, and you indicated that uh, in the lead up to the events in Ottawa, you were of the view that this was not going to be what you referred to as an in and out event. Um, but just to be clear, you were not one of the organizers of this event, correct? That's correct. I, I believe I may have been misconstrued as such or, or perceived to be a, a bigger personality in this simply because of my social media presence and a video that I had released basically reacting to um, the convergence of, of the trucks moving towards Ottawa. I was, you know, kind of excited by it and interested in what was going to happen. That, that video achieved a fair amount of uh, traction in place. So I think maybe people associated me with that for that reason. Uh, however, I no, I had no time to have any contact with any organizers. I didn't um, ask for any money, take any money, give any money. I had no hand in logistics, planning, anything like that. I was simply... Uh, there of my own volition to observe and, you know, just be there for the experience. So you really had no knowledge as to the specific intentions uh, of the organizers, except for whatever perhaps you were seeing online. Is that fair? The, as, as far as the intentions were concerned, I was um, basically just collating the information that I could find in, in social media, what, what people were saying. I was aware of who some of the people were, um, uh, for that reason, and um, they were echoing the same, you know, similar kind of sentiments. They were there to, you know, to uh, protest and, and show their discontent and, and uh, exercise their rights um, to do so and so on. Um, I didn't have any, I, I didn't see anything disagreeable with that. I didn't see any um, intentions of, you know, uh, violence or, or so on. Right, but with respect to your comment in terms of this not being an in and out event, um, are you aware that the organizers or some of them testified earlier this week that this event become became much more significant than they had really anticipated? Um, no, I was not. I haven't been able to uh, view much of the or hear much of uh, what's you know, transpired earlier. It was apparent to me just simply because of the, the Canada's a very large country and uh, the effort required just to simply go to Ottawa from Alberta and British Columbia um, in, in Halifax and so on. Um, indicated to me, and the numbers of which people were going indicated to me that this was not going to be a, a, a quick uh, trip to the, to the city, as it were. Are you aware that, uh, similarly, that some of the organizers testified that they had not anticipated staying as long as they ultimately did? Uh, no, I'm not. Okay. Uh, I'm going to move on to the issue of social media. Obviously, we heard uh, some testimony from you today about the, your particular use of social media. Would you agree with me that social media is a tool that some people use to influence the actions of others? 
Yes, of course. In fact, it's actually a career now, being a social media influencer. Uh, yes, some people uh, make a living that way. And it's a tool that's used to encourage people to buy things or uh, used for social advocacy? Uh, yes, I think it's empowered um, a lot of people to um, express their voice in the world and, and establish themselves as, as, as such if they want to act similarly to the way that uh, corporate broadcasting and larger companies and stuff do to push whatever products, ideas, and things that, that they want to. They can now compete with them in that same kind of uh, that same kind of space, I suppose. So then, I take it you would agree with me that social media has the power, both unintentionally and intentionally, to influence the actions of others. Uh, I, I, I would say that anything that anyone is paying Sorry, a large amount a, of attention if, to. If you just hold on a moment, your your counsel is is standing up here. I'm not sure social media can have an intent. I'm not sure the question is precise, and I'm not sure how relevant it is in the circumstances. Perhaps social media users could have that kind of power, but my client, I don't think it's fair for him to testify about the power that social media has in terms of intent and lack of intent. I was speaking specifically to social media influencers, but I'm happy to be more clear if that's required. I think you have to be more clear. Social media is something we should be looking into, but uh, sure. you could try and rephrase the question. Happy to. So to be clear, Mr. McKenzie, I'm speaking obviously specifically to the users that are using social media. Uh, and in terms of influencing others, my question was, would you agree with me that those using social media can both intentionally and unintentionally influence others? Uh, yes, of course. I would, I would imagine that any, any form of uh, media, whether it's social media, television, movies, music, and, and if they're inundated, especially um, you know, in, in, in sort of uh, a way that that becomes a large focus of their day-to-day their -day lives, then, then it would have an impact on the way that they uh, view things, of course. And you indicated earlier that depending on the platform and depending on the specific post, um, that anywhere between tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of people have followed you? It's unclear. I mean, there's no real way to, to measure, um, but it, tens of thousands would, would probably be a fair assessment, yes. Uh, I think you, re you may have indicated that one of your YouTube videos may have garnered up to half a million views. Do I have that incorrect? Uh, no, several, several of them have in the past, yes. Okay. So I'm not going to take you to this um, specific document, but for the record, it's OPP 835, and it's a document published by the Canadian Anti-Hate Network, which I take from your earlier testimony you disagree with, um, but it describes Diagalon, also referred to as Plaid Army, as a conspiracy-based network that is increasingly evolving into a militia compri comprising neo-fascists who anticipate a violent revolution which they will seize power. Um, I take it you disagree with that assessment of the organization. Is that fair? Yes, I disagree, and I, I don't agree that this is an or my imagination is an organization of any kind. I'm not clear on what neo-fascist accelerationist means, um, and in my opinion, the Canadian Anti-Hate Network is not a credible uh, news or information research source. Fair enough, but I take it you would agree with me that at least some people might interpret your messaging in that way, because obviously the Canadian Anti-Hate Network does. Again, um, sure. Uh, I can't control how people in interpret or don't interpret uh, you know, any number of things. I can only control the things that I say and, and conduct myself the best that I can. And if it's interpreted the wrong way, then I'm happy to clarify it. But I, I can't, again, uh, be expected to control the interpretations of other people. Fair enough. I'll just ask one more question because I believe I'm getting the signal that I'm out of time. Um, but as a follow-up to that, there were a few veiled references to violence that we uh, saw earlier counsel take you to, and you indicated in response to those that it certainly wasn't your intention to promote violence and that your followers would know that. Is that a fair assessment of your answer? Yes, I think so. Um, but it's true that you have not obviously spoken to all of your followers, right? Well, 
I don't exactly take attendance, so there's there's no way to know who is listening to me at any number of times. All I can do is uh, use my platforms accordingly, and if it's listened to or not by individual people is not within my control. And so you obviously couldn't know how they are interpreting your message. Uh, no. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions. Okay, uh, next is the uh, Ontario Provincial Police. Commissioner, I have no questions. Thank you. Okay, next is uh, counsel for uh, former Chief Slowly. Commissioner, also no questions for the witness. Thank you. Okay, next is the Government of Alberta. Thank you, Commissioner. We have no questions either. Okay, the uh, Democracy Fund, uh, JCCF. Uh, this is Antoine Dailly for the Citizens for Freedom. Um, our group would like to cede our time to counsel uh, for the witness. Oh, this seems to be a popular person, uh, Mr. Foda. I, uh, I guess it's your turn. They seem to have collected a lot of support. I won't need all the time, Mr. Commissioner, but I'm happy to commence now. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. McKenzie. Can you see me? Yes, sir. This is the first time you've seen me actually on video. That is correct. I want to start off with um, just covering some of the questions that you were asked by the last council council for the Ottawa Police Service. Okay. The Canada Anti-Hate Network, um, you were asked about sort of the information uh, that they've put out there uh, about you. Are you aware if the Canada yeah. Anti-Hate Network has itself spread any uh, misinformation during the convoy? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, the, the president or the, the chief, as I understand it, Mr. Farber, was on uh, national television advising the, the nation of Canada that anti-Semitic flyers were being distributed throughout downtown Ottawa as a result of the, the nature of the people involved, when in fact that was a screen grab from an event in Miami, Florida that had taken place weeks earlier. And do you know if um, the Canada Anti-Hate Network's uh, views about you have been relied upon by law enforcement or other senior officials in the federal government? Yes, I have through, again, legal disclosure, um, documents referenced by, by law enforcement, open source intelligence and so on. There are a number of uh, pages and articles and, and, and things written by the Canadian Anti-Hate Network used as justification for their assessment of me. And um, have you ever had any communication with anyone from the Canada Anti-Hate Network? Uh, I have, actually. Um, one of their uh, journalists, uh, Mr. Smith, I believe, uh, reached out to me in um, just as late as February uh, of this year. Previous to that, no one had ever approached me for a comment or, or explanation. They were content to just publish things, sometimes with no bylines whatsoever, written by ostensibly no one. Um, I attempted to explain and, and uh, kind of level, you know, man to man with Mr. Smith about, you know, who I am and so on. Uh, that didn't really go anywhere. Um, I'd also been in contact um, informally, casually with um, Mr. Kurt Phillips, over uh, over Twitter um, over the past uh, several months before and, I was banned. Uh, and did your conversations have anything to do about the convoy or your alleged extremist activities? No, they were um, pretty casual in nature, um, just about uh, kind of surface level things about, the, about uh, other you know personalities and stuff. Um, other maybe casual bits, sometimes uh, different beers that we enjoyed, uh, things like this. Um, you were asked um, questions about social media and social media influ influencers and their ability to either unintentionally or intentionally uh, influence others. Uh, what are your views right. on um, legacy media being able to do that? Well, um, Again, yeah, with seeing the size of the platform that it has and the amount of funding 
that's being dumped into it from the Canadian taxpayer. It's um, one of the, the bigger microphones that exists, and, and it's my opinion that it has um, an extreme amount of bias and has been almost weaponized in that way to uh, push state and government messaging to influence and you know perhaps correct the way that uh, people are thinking as it benefits uh, the people that pay their bills. Uh, I, I'd like to pull up uh, P-O-E dot jmk 701 it's an article from the globe and mail can you see this article on your screen mr mckenzie yes sir are you familiar with it uh no i've never seen this before okay if we could scroll down a little bit and stop right there for a moment. Could you please um, read that, Mr. McKenzie, and tell us when you're done? Uh, yes, sir. You want me to read it aloud or just to yourself? No, nope, just to yourself. I'm going to just cover some okay. of the content in that. Okay. Yeah, I've got it. Thanks. Okay, if we could go down a little bit further. Okay. And a little bit further. And then just a little bit further. Great. So um, this uh, this was an article that was published around February sixteenth, after the uh, Emergencies Act was invoked by the government. Okay. And there are comments made by public safety minister uh, about um, that were later clarified uh, by his spokesperson. Uh, Mr. Mendicino didn't name any, any organization during the news conference, but his spokesperson, Alexander Cohen, uh, later said that the minister's remarks were in reference to Diagalon. I see. If we could go up just a little bit further uh, to the comments that were actually made by Mr. Mendicino. For, no, further up, please. Um, right there. So, quote, it could have been deadly for citizens, protesters, and officers. We need to be clear-eyed about the seriousness of these incidents, and indeed, several of the individuals at Coots have strong ties to a far-right extreme organizations with leaders who are in Ottawa. How many members, uh, so, or sorry, how many uh, of the individuals at Coots did you have any ties to? Um, just the, the, again, the Mr. Lysak who I met uh, twice. And would you consider that to be strong ties? No. Uh, would you consider this to be an example of misinformation or no? Yes, I would. Uh, I'd like to um, pull up some of the clips, sir, that um, council have referenced, but that we've not um, actually gone over with you. If I could first ask that, um, JMK uh, 000, I think there's seven zeros and four. And this is a clip I understand from your social media dated January 23rd of this year, sir. So as long as everybody just keeps their head, don't do anything stupid, say anything stupid, anything, nothing illegal, don't even speed. Don't give them anything. Uh, wh where was that uh, video taken, sir? Uh, that video was filmed uh, outside um, downtown the waterfront in Picton, Nova Scotia, where I live. And what was your intent in putting out that video? That was um, the day or, or two days prior to me uh, heading down to Ottawa. I know a lot of people were, were on their way. They were excited to go and so on. I was, it was my intent to try and set a tone of, of extreme levels of, um, of, of aware, situational awareness and, and attentiveness to the fact that there would be a lot of scrutiny uh, on, on everyone. And so it was imperative that people conduct themselves in a responsible and lawful manner. If we could play another clip, please, uh, 702, JMK 702. 
This is a clip I understand, Mr. Behavior, and uh, if you sorry, if we could just go back to the beginning, Mr. McKenzie, I understand this was taken on January twenty eighth. If you could please just watch it. Please be on your best behavior, and uh, if you see anything odd or strange or uh, makes you nervous or uncomfortable, uh, leave, leave immediately, and um, keep your you know your your phone, uh, your camera is probably your your best defense. Uh, if you see anything strange, uh, you know, film it. Where was um, this uh, video taken, sir? Uh, that video appears to be taken in, in the, uh, the, the uh, residence I mentioned earlier that we uh, stayed at a large amount of the time uh, outside the city of Ottawa. And what was the message that you were trying to convey? Um, I was just trying to keep people safe. And, and again, if, if they know, I obviously wouldn't want them to intervene into something that seemed, uh, you know, unsafe or dangerous. But if they could, you know, I, I believe that the, as, as dangerous as they could be, the, the, the smartphones that people have can be their best defense. They can film, uh, you know, what's happening around them and, and protect themselves in that way. And, and uh, if they were to encounter or see anything disturbing or, or frightening or alarming, um, then, then they should uh, leave and, and get away from that and then um, potentially even report it to uh, authorities if necessary. Speaking about reporting things to authorities, have you ever reported extremist behavior to authorities? Yes. Can you please tell us about that? Um, uh, one example, um, let's see, this is would have been fall, I think, of 2021. Um, there was a group online identifying themselves as Lynx something. Um, it was armed men in the woods with masks. Um, one of them specifically said, uh, this is a call to arms, which as I understand is an illegal thing to do. Um, it was very clear that they intended to, um, uh, we were promoting the idea of, of arming, uh, arming people, arming citizens. I think, it, I think it was an acronym for liberate your neighborhood or something like that. Um, and to engage the, you know, forces of the state in, in violent confrontation. Um, they were commenting on my videos and inferring that they were, were trying to connect with me and so on. Uh, I found this very alarming and again, putting my, potentially myself at risk, but other, you know, people that, uh, follow me and, and it could be exposed to this and ensnared in, in whatever was going on there. So I, once I became aware of the video, I immediately called the the, the, the amount of police about it. And did you receive a response? I did. They called me back. They they asked me, you know, what I knew about it. Um, you know, if anything, I said, all I know is what I've seen on the internet. I'm simply bringing it to your attention because if I were you, this is something that would concern me. Um, and that was pretty much the, the end of that interaction. I'm not sure uh, whatever took place uh, after that, but. Um, you didn't have follow up after that. Um, I, I, I don't think so. I think there was a one constable from from Saskatchewan that may have called me to say they may have more questions in the future, but uh, that was the end of that interaction. Were you willing to have a continuous relationship with law enforcement to assist them in uh, identifying legitimate threats to public safety? Of course, of course, if I could, if there was anything for me to 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 give them or assist them in any way, I would have yes. Um, I'd like to uh, play another clip, JMK701. Uh, and my understanding is that this is uh, a clip from February 5th. Support each other. Tell the truth. Be good. Don't do anything stupid and don't give in to their uh, attempts to goad you into, into uh, anything they can use against you. Because this is literally all they have at this point. This couple of, couple of sentences out of context on the internet and uh, an old man at a gas station. <laughs> it's ridiculous, you know? Meanwhile, uh, the, the, the high horse they stand on. Oh, we're so much better people. We're so much better people. We are, we are morally superior, said the man in blackface. Uh, where were you when this video was taken, sir? Uh, I believe I was driving, traveling back to Ottawa from, from the Maritimes. Okay. Can you please tell the commissioner um, 
sort of what your um, itinerary was during the convoy protests? Um, from beginning to, to end, or? Uh, yeah, my understanding is that you were not in Ottawa the entire time. Can you uh, right. sort of just go yeah. over, in general terms, your itinerary? Yeah. So I uh, left the Maritimes, um, again, a couple of days. I arrived uh, one or two days before the trucks showed up. I picked up uh, a couple of uh, friends and associates. Uh, they wanted to go. It was car kind of a carpool idea, so I would take them. Uh, we went down, um, met up with some people, stayed at the, uh, at the location I mentioned, and then after f roughly five days or so, uh, these these gentlemen had to go home. Um, I drove them home. I only intended to stay uh, for that length of time, um, and then when I got home, I decided I was it, it was clear, it was it was uh, unclear how long this was going to go on, uh, so um, I decided to go back uh, a few days later. Um, that's around that time when I made that video. And then uh, I stayed in Ottawa, the Ottawa area for the duration um, until probably th three to four days after the uh, invocation of the Emergency Act and uh, everyone was cleared out of downtown. Um, then uh, my, my partner and I um, left and uh, moved, went, we headed back to the Maritimes. When you were in Ottawa, did you engage in any illegal activity? No. Uh, did you bring a vehicle? Yes, I drove my uh, my personal vehicle. It's a, a pickup truck. Where did you park? Um, either on the the farm where we were staying, or hotel parking lots that I you know would stay at, or if it was in the interest of going downtown to to, uh, to to see the protest, I would park in parking lots and that were available as close as possible, and then walk the remaining couple of blocks. Did you pay for parking? Yes. Did you assault anyone while you were in Ottawa? No. Threaten anyone while you were there? No. Did you engage in violent behavior? No, sir. Were you armed? No. Were you charged with any offenses in relation to your participation to the con uh, in the convoy in Ottawa? No, sir. Do you believe, uh, or do you know whether or not your public uh, political commentary has drawn the ire of officials? That is my belief, yes. Sir, um, you were asked questions about uh, whether you had any, uh, whether uh, Diagonal had any um, structure. I think you were asked if you had any formal authority over anyone in the Diagonal community. And I believe you indicated Correct. that there was no hierarchy, uh, or no formal structure. Correct. Uh, to be fair, you have a vice president. Uh, yes. Could you tell the commissioner who your vice president is? Uh, the vice president is of, of Diagonal, which is of my imagination. He is a, uh, a, a my sidekick uh, that has evolved over the years. He's a, he's a demonic goat figurine named Philip with a uh, very, very serious narcotics problem and uh, time traveling ability. Do you think any reasonable person who consumes your content either regularly or semi-regularly would actually consider Diagonal to be an organization? I, I would think not, no. How do you explain uh, what is included in intelligence reports and what is expressed in uh, national media and expressed by ministers of the highest level in our country? <clears throat> it's my opinion that the foundational work by the Canadian Anti-Hate Network as pertains to targeting me as a previously government funded, has enjoyed a fair amount of government funding to target and smear people um, that they you know consider perhaps politically inconvenient or people that just uh, want to shut up. Um, they regularly engage in defamatory statements, uh, libelous action, things like this out of context uh, statements, they'll take a clip here, a sentence there, and, and stitch it together and, and make it appear as, as, as something that it is not. Um, from there, um, some media outlets, legacy media outlets, um, lazily, unfortunately it appears, uh, took it at face value, copy paste, print the story, then which is uh, consumed by um, police officers, which uh, 
again, unfortunately, rather than uh, doing any digging themselves or investigating or asking me a single question, take these things at face value and compile these reports and uh, up the uh, up the network it goes until it lands on the desk of the public safety minister or, or you know, perhaps even uh, the prime minister's office where they're faced with these uh, scenarios that have no basis in reality. Um, I consider this entire situation entirely avoidable. This um, None of this needed to happen. And it's absurd. And I consider it the single most embarrassing and grotesque intelligence failure in national history. Uh, Mr. Mather, um, when he first uh, started asking you questions, clarified that you're, uh, you're obviously testifying from in custody? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and my understanding is you have no uh, criminal record? That's correct. How do you intend on pleading to all of the charges that you face? Not guilty. Those are my questions. Okay. Thank you. Any uh, re-examination? Uh, no, Mr. Commissioner. Thank you. Okay. Well, th thank you for your testimony, uh, Mr. McKenzie, and good luck with your trials. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. Next, uh, 